to Dr. Gish, who will speak to us about hepatitis B. Bob? Good morning, everybody. Thanks again for having me, Dr. Donovan, the rest of the Southern California team. We're going to not talk about Ferraris or bicycles, but maybe Elon Musk's jetpack or something here with the Heptize B world. Let me see if I can get this to go forward. Um, I'm working a lot of places around the world, working with a lot of different companies in the Heptize B space. So I'm going to try to give you some clinical perspectives and what's happening. Most of this will be clinical data, but there'll be a little bit of animal data in here also, which I think will be a little bit provocative. My disclosures are on my website. Feel free to use that website for resources. There's a lot of slides, a lot of other information that's posted there, as well as a newsletter you can subscribe to. So almost 300 million people are infected today who are surface antigen positive. That number keeps changing. I'm going to be giving a talk at HEPDART this week on why that number keeps moving around. A lot of deaths, uh, 600,000 deaths attributed to HBV, number one cause of liver cancer, and that liver cancer is number two or number three in terms of cancer-related mortality. And we want to keep in mind that we're not using the word cure with any of our colleagues or patients with hepatitis B. A little bit more here, of course, surface antigen positivity, simple word, infection. These are rules that you can use when you're talking to your colleagues or teaching or your patients. Core positive means exposure, and if you have exposure, that patient still has CCC DNA in their liver. That's persistent disease. This risk of reactivation Paul covered with hepatitis C DAAs is not real in S antigen negative patients, so, but it is an issue for a variety of other immunomodulatory drugs. There's a lot of fake news out about giving boosters to patients who are core positive alone, trying to see if that might be a false positive test. But the false positive rate for core antibody positivity is two per thousand. And this has been true actually for almost uh, 18 years. So you don't need to vaccinate those individuals. There's no clinical benefit. Even if you get a little bit of surface antibody response, that doesn't benefit the patient clinically. Anti-HBS means immunity if core is negative. And we don't use the word natural immunity anymore. That's also uh, fake news. There is no natural immunity to hepatitis B. Once you're exposed, you have the hepatitis B residual disease in your liver in the form of CCC DNA lifelong. So moving a little bit further, when a person is surface antigen positive, these are all the tests that I do on every single patient. But I want to highlight here the quantitative surface antigens available through Quest and has a lot of clinical utility, staging disease, risk for liver cancer, infectivity, a variety of other issues, response to therapy, who might respond, who is responding. So quant S is part of my assessment. Every patient who's got S antigen should have a Delta test. This is a highly fatal, highly progressive disease. There are new treatments coming out. You actually can use interferon, although the interferon response rate is about 20%. And I'm doing this triple um, biomarker panel. And you can calculate the GALAD score for risk for liver cancer, early detection through MD calc. There's a lot of other information here I think you're familiar with. So what's hot at the liver meeting? That's really what I'm here to present. We're going to walk through a lot of interesting things on virology, immunology, some natural history, current treatments, what are some of the benefits that are there, some of the controversies, and new HPV therapies that are coming out. So um, put on your seatbelt because we're going to be moving through some very interesting information. So hepatitis B, we always think of integrating into the hepatocyte genome. We're going to talk about that a lot today. But this was um, studies that was done including peripheral blood mononuclear cells and looked at an association between chronic hepatitis B and liver cancer, but more importantly, this dendritic cell sarcoma. And what they found was is that hepatitis B is integrating, and these are special maps that they use at integration sites, but they're finding integration not just in liver cell, but also in peripheral blood mononuclear cells. So there's um, integration events and reservoir events for PBMC. So is cure possible? Well, it's a long way out. We're going to be talking about maybe getting to a real cure, a sterilizing cure someday. But this is a much more difficult virus to treat than hepatitis C for a lot of molecular and virologic and immunologic reasons. All right, so now we have a patient on nukes. We got three different nukes that are available to us. Um, we have Intecavir, TDF, and TAF. 
Once a person loses surface antigen, we typically consolidate for six to 12 months. Some people go longer, is there really a need? And this study said consolidating for one to two years, two to three years, or beyond three years had the same low uh, relapse rate or on clinical relapse. So basically, if you're treating with a nuke, they lose S antigen, you can stop at one year, but you need to monitor them for relapse uh, for at least three years after that. All okay. right, Nucle uh, nucleoside analog induced HS is durable. This just talked about continuing therapy after S loss or stopping therapy after S loss. What was interesting about this study is that some patients on nukes that lost S actually reverted, zero reverted and became S antigen positive on that nuke, but it didn't matter whether you stopped or continued, the relapse rate was under 10%. So one year, stop, monitor, expect a relapse rate of S antigen about 10%, and consider putting those patients back on therapy. All right, so we have TAF that's been available now for over two years. This is a major advance. It's a much lower dose, much lower exposure. Instead of 300 milligrams, it's 25 milligrams. It's really a liver targeting prodrug. And the label has changed now, so TAF can be used in dialysis patients at the standard 25 milligrams per day. You typically would dose it um, on the dialysis days uh, an hour after dialysis. But high efficacy in terms of HBV DNA suppression ALT normalization. So, so much of this TAF is delivered to the liver, the systemic exposure is low. Even in people with moderate to severe renal insufficiency that are not yet on dialysis, did not have any change in their renal function. So, it looks very safe in this setting, very e efficacious. And as you know from the prospective trials in the E antigen positive and E antigen negative patients that led to the licensing, there was a higher rate of ALT normalization. So, my two drugs of choice are either Entecavir or TAF in my clinic uh, managing hepatitis uh, B patients, and this ALT normalization is one of, one of those reasons. All right, so big hot topic came out. There's a couple of papers that said that uh, TDF had a much lower risk of liver cancer than Entecavir. Uh, there was some controversy about those studies, how the studies were designed in Korea. One was a positive study with lower risk. Another study came out that said it wasn't lower risk, it had the same risk. So people have gotten very complex in terms of their analysis here and looking at a pooled hazard ratio for HCC between TDF and Entecavir, and this is basically an all-comer study, and this is looking at these propensity scored match cohorts. And everything is pointing, in my opinion now, to a lower risk of HCC with TDF. Uh, Ray Kim presented a paper in a U.S. insurance cohort that was in adult patients that were sort of in a mid-age range, not in a Medicare population, that showed the same uh, benefit. So I'm thinking about uh, TDF or TAF, because it's a TDF-like analog, as having some potential liver protection. So as you heard from Hugo, every patient's on a statin. And now I'm thinking about uh, TDF or TAF for my patients over in Tecavir in terms of ALT normalization and maybe a lower liver cancer risk. Why do I still use Entecavir today? Well, in the clinic where I work in San Diego, which is an FQHC, Entecavir price is one-tenth the price of TDF and TAF, so we are biased towards Entecavir there because of cost. But I might put a patient on TAF in that setting if they're increased risk for renal disease, bone disease, and I perceive an increased risk for liver cancer that may be above uh, background population. All right, so what about screening and treatment. We have this huge decrement in terms of patients who are S antigen positive who actually undergo a full evaluation. So 26% had a complete evaluation, which I described to you at least my evaluation on a previous slide, within a year of diagnosis. So something's missing here. Why are we not getting every S antigen patient for, through a full evaluation? And then treatment eligible small number because a small number were actually evaluated and the number of people on treatment was only about 2%. So we're terribly under screening, under linking to care and under treating patients with hepatitis B. I think that's really um, the word that comes from this study. Well, we're going to shift now and talk about hepatitis B life cycle, many, many different drug targets. This virus, unfortunately, is much more complicated than hepatitis C. So we're looking at entry inhibitors. You just heard about this very interesting study in Canada from uh, Jordan Feld with this uh, azetimide. 
And we've got inhibitors of viral transcripts that we'll talk about. We'll talk about CCC DNA silencing. There's a variety, a variety of new immunomodulators that are coming out. Something called core inhibitors or CPAMs. Uh, potentially new reverse transcriptase or polymerase inhibitors and release inhibitors. These are NAPs. And I'm going to not cover every single one of these, but hot topics at the meeting. In this HPV cure, where we have to get rid of all CCC DNA, we have to get rid of all integrants, have to get rid of extra hepatic hepatitis B, we're going after this virus with many, many different targets, including activating host immunity, including TLR7, TLR8. There's an oral agent called inorigavir. It's a rig I uh, agonist that's there. Some newer vaccines that are coming out also. And we'll talk a little bit about PD-1, PDL one since that's a super hot topic in the uh, liver cancer world also today. So back to what do we have? We have entecavir, TDF, and TAF that are available. Um, interferons being used in less than 1% of patients. I'm putting up this to say lamivudine and adefavir should not be used in your patients. Even if you get pushback from a couple of the insurance companies I've seen that were recommending only lamivudine, that uh, was very scary to me. There was just really no role for these other uh, uh, older agents in practice today. So to get to a real cure, a sterilizing cure, we're going to have to basically extract all of the integrated uh, DNA inside the hepatocyte genome because those integrants are making S antigen. So you clear the virus from the hepatocyte cytoplasm, you clear CCC DNA, you're still going to have S antigen production from these integrants that are there. We had a really nice paper that we uh, published with the Arrowhead team about these integrants in, uh, in chimps, and we think it's very, very much uh, uh, applicable to the human model. So this was using CRISPR. As you know, this is a um, gene editing tool, and this is in a mouse model, but they're actually able, using a guide RNA, to um, extract or uh, excise those integrated HBS genes. So, and the delivery was 71%. We have a big problem with CRISPR technology of just transfecting maybe 2 or 3% of cells, but this was a much higher one using some special uh, lenti vectors and their viral vector. This may get to human trials sometime in the next 5 to 10 years. So this is a little bit of science, but not science fiction. All right, let's get a little bit more to real. <clears throat> we have these capsid allosteric modulators, CAMs or CPAMs, two different classes that are there. As you can see, we've got many, many companies that are very involved with this, including J&J, &J, um, Assembly, um, Aligos that's here, um, uh, Roche that's involved in this. So these are very, very much looking like maybe a sofospivir-like backbone for treating hepatitis B because we're blocking the formation of a capsid. You don't have a capsid, the virus can't be released from the cell in an infectious form. So very, very exciting data. What are we seeing historically? Two to three log reduction in HBV DNA. We have a new marker, HBV RNA, after 28 days. And now we're going out with longer term duration. We're actually seeing S antigen reduction in cer certain patients. And I'm just going to go to this slide, which is a build on the last one, of S antigen decline of about half a log at about a median follow-up of about 34 weeks. So the data on CPAMs is starting to come out. Again, it's going to be about combination therapy, which I'll get into in a moment. We're seeing a nice signal with CPAMs on having multiple effects and an implication that we might be having an effect on the CCC DNA pool because we're not recycling and rebuilding CCC DNA inside the, the nucleus. That's uh, at least the proposal. Okay, so we have some other ways to attack this virus. We have what are called linked nucleic acids, um, and these are anti-sense oligonucleotides. That's what ASO stands for. Then we have small interfering RNA. So we can deliver RNA to the cell. It binds the viral RNA, and it's cleaved by uh, what's called a risk complex. Or we have these anti-sense oligonucleotides, which are a DNA-like structure, binding RNA, also cleaving through an RNA ACE H. And we're finally, this is you know, very, very incredible science, and we're starting to see some very interesting systems because we've got better delivery. We're using these GALNAC deliveries, which bind to an acyaloglycoprotein receptor. It can get very, very high levels of these uh, drugs inside these cells to bind to uh, some native systems to cleave uh, the RNA that's there. So this is J&J, &J, which purchased the Arrowhead HPV iRNA that I've been working on uh, since 2011 with Arrowhead. 
And we're showing some very, very nice decline in surface antigen, multiple log decline. And the way the arrowhead, the second generation arrowhead was, is this targeted not just the messenger RNA that was coming off CCC DNA, but also measuring and targeting the messenger RNA coming off the integrant. So this is really the only drug that's in development that's going after the integrants and with S antigens being, uh, pr being produced from the integrants. And it'll be basically, I think, be another backbone. So we got CPAMs as a highly likely backbone and interfering RNA as another backbone to try to get to this ultimate target of S clearance. And I think as you hear about this, this is the triple therapy now. We've got an RNAi, a CAM on top of a nuke, and we're showing multi-log S antigen reduction in these individuals, multi-log HPV DNA reduction in these individuals. And we might get to my ideal sort of next phase, which is S loss in the 30% range. And about 60% of patients will still have S, but they'll have a stable HPV DNA that's either low or preferably undetectable. And then 10% will be highly replicative, S antigen positive DNA. And I'm ideally, uh, I'm gonna propose that this would be about a one year of this triple or potentially even four drug therapy to get to this next wave of uh, S antigen loss. Today, S loss with our best nuke data is about 10% uh, uh, at five years. And we're stopping nukes on patients to also bring some patients to S loss because people, when you stop nukes, can have a little bit of a flare. But the best case scenario is 15, 18% of patients are gonna lose S antigen on our best nuke um, algorithms that we have today. So these antisense oligonucleotides, uh, antisense are being developed by Roche, GSK, and Ionis, uh, which unfortunately had the name of ISIS before and they had to change that. Um, so, so Ionis has a partnership with GSK, and actually, so GSK has actually two of these antisense. Um, I'm on the DSMB of, of um, the um, GSK collaboration with Ionis, and uh, they just published their data at um, AASLD showing a very, very nice uh, decline in S antigen, which is really what we want to see in, in uh, these patients, at least as an early signal. So translation inhibitors, there's something coming up with what are called mRNA destabilizers. This is something I just learned about in the last few weeks, this PAP molecule destabilized the transcripts, and that comes from both integrated and CCC DNA. Uh, so I think this is another exciting area that we'll be looking at in terms of drug development. Let's switch to immunity or the immune system against hepatitis B. As we mentioned, there is no natural immunity. And there's really four phases of the immune interaction between the virus and the host immune system. Early, you've got these very high HPV DNA levels, normal ALT. So this is an immune quiescent stage. They used to call it immune tolerant. We've got some better terms for that now. The patient shifts to more active form. ALT goes up. DNA starts drifting down. This is immune active. During this time, there's what's called immune exhaustion that's taking place. So the T cells, the dendritic cells, the other parts of the immune system are really decreasing their ability to recognize the virus, control the virus. Then there's something called clonal deletion where these immune cells that recognize hepatitis B are gone. So where is that patient? How old are they? How long have they had disease? Where is their immune system in terms of the interaction with the virus? makes it complicated to design studies and try to get the right drug to the right patient. The big message is treat earlier, treat, have a very low threshold to treat patients because the earlier you treat, the more likely the immune system is going to be able to take over. So there's a TLR7 agonist that was being developed by Gilead that did not show any significant antiviral effect, but it looks like we have a second generation from Roche showing very interesting immune response and at ASLD, they also showed an S antigen decline with this TLR7 molecule. TLR8, we were waiting for this information. This is a much more broad-based acting toll-like receptor agonist that Gilead's developing. And we now are seeing some later information on this where there's S antigen decline as well as cytokine induction. So I'm excited about the science behind the TLR8, and I think this is gonna continue to move forward in uh, patient, uh, patient populations as part of combination therapy. So we have these protein death ligand, uh, PD-1 receptors, PDL one receptors. This is a big part of what's going on in tr treating liver cancer, right? We've got Pembro, Lizumab, Nivolumab that have 
specific activity against liver cancer. They also saw some early signals that it might actually have an effect on hepatitis B replication. And that was a publication from Ed Gain that recently has been updated, hopefully will be in peer-reviewed literature soon. But they're now starting to come up with maybe better targeting with less off-target effects. So um, in this uh, model that was used here, there was an induction of the immune system and an S antigen decline um, in this specific model that took place. So we may have more targeted PD-1, PD-L1 molecules that we can use in viral infection and not worry about this you know, three, five, seven percent risk of pulmonary um, inflammatory bowel disease, autoimmune liver disease that we see with um, the PD-1, PD-L1s and, and liver cancer practice. So these cures going to be a lot of different combination studies, replication inhibition, antigen reduction, immune stimulation. Typically, these are going to be on top of nukes, but if the drug's strong enough, we may be able to get rid of nukes early or start those in nuke-naive patients. Those are all part of the specific study designs. Complicated world, I think there's 60 drugs now, I count, that are in development for hepatitis B, at least 20 companies that are fully active in this space. They saw what happened with hepatitis C, right? We were dealing with incredible side effects with interferon and our uh, early generation protease inhibitors. Suddenly in 2013, we come out with all oral regimens. Now we're talking about just getting drug to patients. I think we'll be there with hepatitis B somewhere between three and 10 years from now. And maybe at the point where you just say your surface antigen positive, you go on treatment. We're trying to get that viral replication down. We're trying to decrease antigen burden. That's S antigen, E antigen, something new called correlated antigen that we have at least research assays for. And we're trying to boost the immune response. We really got to go across all uh, these different spectrums. All right, since we've had a very long, nice discussion on NASH today, which was fantastic uh, uh, from our uh, Mazen and Hugo this morning and has blended into some of the other presentations, you really have to assess every hepatitis B patient for NASH and metabolic syndrome. You've got to, got to put that into that assessment early. Same thing with alcohol, uh, liver injury in your hepatitis B patients. Steatohepatitis worsens HPV-induced liver injury. There's a nice study from Rohit Lumba, Gastro 2011, that showed that NASH plus hepatitis B had at least a five-fold increased risk of HCC. So you really have to think about, you've got a patient suppressed on hepatitis B, going back and doing a NAFLD score, a metabolic workup, doing your fiber scan, doing a FAST test with your fiber scan, combining that with your uh, CAP score, and treat that steatohepatitis in parallel with managing the hepatitis B. This is very interesting. Uh, we keep talking about giving our cirrhotic patients anticoagulants. Um, there's a little bit of a hot topic out about antiplatelet therapy using, um, using aspirin uh, or other antiplatelet agents and decreasing the risk of HCC. I'd have to say most of us are pretty uh, adverse to giving somebody, especially with cirrhosis, an antiplatelet drug or giving them heparin, which was shown in another study to benefit patients. But I thought this was interesting that antiplatelet therapy may have an uh, anti-HCC effect. So coffee's good, statins are good. I'm not ready to be using antiplatelet agents in these patients, but I'm gonna continue to watch this uh, data. All right, so what about monitoring? Surveillance for liver cancer, right? Screening's the first test. Surveillance is ongoing testing. This is a study that was done in Korea, brought in about 400,000 patients, regular follow-up, identified these hepatitis B patients, the ones that were at risk. They had 22% uh, of those patients, 94,000 that were compliant. There were a lot of no-shows, 78,000 patients. By having a compliant and regular surveillance, the risk of death from liver cancer had a 44% reduction. So really nice hazard ratio here, 0.56. So figure out how to get your patients back with text reminders, email reminders, phone calls, educating those patients, bring them back. Surveillance really makes a difference. So in the last few minutes, I'm gonna talk about one of my favorite subjects, which is Delta hepatitis. Mentioned before, if someone's S antigen positive, do an anti-HDV test that's available through LabCorp or Quest. The tests are probably about 90, 93% sensitive. You have a low chance of missing uh, Delta if um, the anti-HDV test is negative. Delta patients have a 70% risk of cirrhosis, liver cancer, liver failure, transplant, and death in less than 10 years. Pegylated interferon can do two things. You have about 20% 
SVR rate or durable, durable viral response rate. Another 20% have a reset in their HBV, HDV RNA level down about two logs. If you reset the HDV RNA level, you have a much better outcome, lower risk of cancer, liver failure, transplant, or death. So pegylated interferon at least still has a role. We have some new drugs that are in the work right now. There's a lonafarnib, ritonavir, peg interferon, is with Pegasus that's now in a phase three global study. And I work and consult with Iger, and this is a very, very interesting study. It's a very well-designed study, and it's going to answer questions about this outcome. There's a PEG interferon lambda that's been around for quite some time. It was first developed um, in Seattle, and BMS took it over for treating hepatitis B. Lambda has a lot less side effects than standard interferon. And this, in this uh, study that was shown uh, at ASLD, there was a reset in HDV RNA level, and there were a number of patients who actually cleared HDV RNA. So I'm predicting lambda interferon will be in phase three studies reasonably soon as well. And probably the combination we'll be using in two to three years will be lonafarnib, ritonavir boosting of lonafarnib through SIP interactions and lambda interferon with a high efficacy rate, high at least durable virologic response rate, and will offer a major advance. So if you have Delta patients, you should look. There's a number of sites in the U.S. that are part of the phase three study. You should be referring those patients. So we have a lot going on. Uh, we've got this backbone of, of CAMs or CPAMs. I think another backbone of siRNAs. Will these be achieving this 30 to 40 percent S loss, which I think would justify delivering a new combination therapy to our patient population and its attendant costs? Uh, there's some in interesting signals with ALT elevations on one of the CPAMs that was uh, taken out of development recently, but does not look like a class effect. And what immunomodulators are we going to be using? Interregavir is an oral interferon-inducing like uh, substance uh, that appears to be reasonably safe and effective. So that may be part of our backbone of one of our, our next steps as well. So assess your hepatitis B patients uh, for NASH. Manage the NASH, of course. Uh, get your patients into clinical trials. There's lots of clinical trials going on in the US looking at these different compounds. Most of the compounds are in phase 1B, 2A, and 2B, but there'll be compounds entering phase three quite soon. We know that liver cancer surveillance reduces mortality, so be doing your biomarkers and ultrasounds every six months. I prefer the triple biomarker panel and calculating this GALAD score. I don't think we're ready for antiplatelet therapy yet, but we're gonna look for some larger studies. I wanna emphasize there's a two-dose vaccine from Dynavax called Heplisav B that's got a much higher response rate with two doses and this is effective across all patients, but especially in older patients who may have some immune system senescence, uh, renal failure patients, diabetic patients. So really think about this as an advance in hepatitis B vaccine uh, efficacy and has an equal safety profile to the other vaccines on the markets. And think about Delta virus um, in your clinical practice if you would. I want to thank all the people who helped organize this meeting and inviting me back here. The HBV Forum is very active in developing new drugs and guiding the FDA and EMEA and a lot of the different people who shared their slides uh, for this. So thanks a lot. A lot of abstracts on these. <laughs>